Uh, let, me, let me tell you my story. I, I call myself a 913 Republican. I grew up uh, a liberal New York Jew. You don't get much more liberal than that, though it was lowercase l, not what's considered liberal today. Graduated from high school knowing one thing about politics, basically, that uh, Democrats are good and Republicans are evil. Um, I tell a story. It's not a true story, but I think it, it, it kind of clarifies what happened to me. I say, imagine being in a restaurant with an old friend, and you're catching up, and suddenly he blurts out, I hate my wife. And you kind of chuckle to yourself because he says it every time you're together, and you know he doesn't hate his wife. They've been together for 35 years. He loves his daughters, and they're just like her. No, 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 he doesn't hate his wife. And you're having some dinner, and you look out the window, and you spot his wife in, you know, out the window, and, and she's being beaten up. And you grab your friend, you say, yeah, come on, come on, let's help her, let's help your wife. And he says, nah, I'm sure she deserves it. At that moment, it dawns on you, he really does hate his wife. Well, that's what 9-11 was to me. I would hear my friends from the left say how evil and horrible and racist and imperialistic and oppressive America is. And I'd laugh to myself, ah, they always say that, they love America. And then on 9-11, we were beaten up. And I grabbed him by the collar, I jumped up and said, come on, let's help her, let's help America. And they said, no, she deserves it. And at that moment, I realized they really do hate America. And it began me on what's now a five-year, five-plus-year quest to try to understand the mindset. How could you possibly live in the freest nation in the history of the world and see only oppression? How could you live in the least imperialist power in human history and see us as the ultimate in imperialism? How could you live in the least bigoted nation in human history and, as Joe Biden said, see, see racism lurking in every dark shadow? And over the next five years, what I came to think through, what I came to learn, what I came to, to find in conversations, and, and became this talk, and hopefully uh, very, very soon will be the, the book Regurgitating the Apple, How Modern Liberals Think. See, I've got, I've got to assume that just about everybody in this room agrees that the Democrats are wrong on just about every issue. Well, I'm here to propose to you it's not just about every issue. It's quite literally every issue. And it's not just wrong, it's as wrong as wrong can be. It's 180 degrees from right. It is diametrically opposed to that which is good, right, and successful. All right, what I discovered is that this is not an accident. This is part of a philosophy that now dominates the whole of Western Europe. And the Democratic Party of today, I, like some others, call it modern liberalism. And the modern liberal will invariably side with evil over good, wrong over right, and the behaviors that lead to failure over those that lead to success. Give the modern liberal the choice between Saddam Hussein and the United States. He will not only side with Saddam Hussein, he will slander America and Americans in order to do so. Give him the choice between the vicious mass murder and corrupt terrorist dictator Yasser Arafat and the tiny and wonderful democracy of Israel. He will plagiarize maps, forge documents, engage in blood libels, as did our former president Jimmy Carter, to side with the terrorist organizations and to attack the tiny state. It's not just foreign policy, it's domestic policy, it's every policy. Give them the choice between promoting teenage abstinence and teenage promiscuity. And believe me, I know this from my hometown of Hollywood. They will use their movies, their TV shows, their, their songs, even the schools, to promote teenage promiscuity as if it's cool. Like the movie American Pie in which you are a loser unless you've had sex with your best friend's mother while you're still a child. Well, conversely, NARAL a uh, pro-abortion group masquerading as a, a pro-choice group will hold a fundraiser called F Abstinence. And it's not just F, it's the entire word because promoting vulgarity is part of their agenda. So the question becomes why? How do they think they're making a better world? Well, the first thing that comes into your mind when trying to understand, as I've so desperately tried to understand, is that if they side always with evil, then they must be evil. But we have a problem with this, don't we? We all know too many people who fit this category who aren't evil. Many of my lifelong friends, the people I grew up with, relatives, close relatives, and they're not evil. So if they're not evil, then the next place your mind goes is, well, they must just be incredibly stupid. <laughs> they don't mean to always side with evil, failed, and wrong. They just don't know what they're doing. But we have a problem with this as well. How, you can't say Bill Maher is a stupid man, my old boss. You can't say Ward Churchill is a stupid man. You can't say all these academics are, are stupid people. And frankly, if it was just stupidity, they'd be right more often. Now, what's the expression? Even a broken clock is right twice a day. Even a, a blind squirrel finds an acorn now and again. 
So if they're not stupid and they're not evil, what's their plan? How do they think they're making a better world? By siding with Saddam Hussein, by keeping his rape and torture rooms open, by seeking the destruction of the, of, of the democracy of Jews. That, I don't know if you've seen a list going around the internet of all the Nobel Prize winning scientists from this tiny state of Israel. How do they think they're making a better world by promoting to children behaviors that, that are inappropriate and, and uh, cause diseases and unwanted pregnancies and ruin people's lives? How do they think they're making a better world? What I discovered is the modern liberal looks back on, give me a number here, 50,000 years, 100,000 years of human civilization, and knows only one thing for sure, that none of the ideas that mankind has come up with, none of the religions, none of the philosophies, none of the ideologies, none of the forms of government, none have succeeded in creating a world devoid of war, poverty, crime, and injustice. So they're convinced that since all of these ideas of man have proved to be wrong, the real cause of war, poverty, crime, and injustice must be found. It can only be found in the attempt to be right. See, if nobody ever thought they were right, what would we disagree about? If we didn't disagree, surely we wouldn't fight. If we didn't fight, of course, we wouldn't go to war. Without war, there'd be no poverty. Without poverty, there'd be no crime. Without crime, there'd be no injustice. It's a utopian vision. And all that's required to usher in this utopia is the rejection of all fact, reason, evidence, logic, truth, morality, and decency. All the tools that you and I use in our attempts to be better people, to make the world more right, by trying to be right, by siding with right, by recognizing what is right and, and, and moving towards it. You know, when this first started to dawn on me, I would take this out and, and, and question my liberal friends, and believe me, there were plenty of them in Hollywood. The thing about Hollywood is it is overwhelmingly liberal, uppercase L, not lowercase L. But there are a lot more of us than you, than you would suspect, but they're afraid. And it's hard to come out because what's so Orwellian, and, and virtually everything about this philosophy is Orwellian, is, is that they are as, the liberals are as illiberal as you can imagine. And quite literally, as much as they scream McCarthyism constantly, there is in fact a gray list there that, that sees people not get hired because they... Uh, because they don't toe the leftist line. So, what, what, what you have is, is people who think that the best way to eliminate rational thought, the best way to eliminate the attempt to be right, is to work always to prove that right isn't right, and to prove that wrong isn't wrong. To bring about a philosophy, and, and you see this in John, uh, John Lennon's song, uh, Imagine. Imagine there's no countries. Not imagine great countries, not imagine defeat the Nazis, imagine no religions. And the key line is imagine a time when anything and everything that mankind values is devalued to the point where there's nothing left to kill or die for. See, now obviously this is not going to happen overnight. There's still going to be religions, but they're going to do their best to denigrate them. There's still going to be countries, but they'll do what they can to get us to cede our national sovereignty to one world bodies. But in the meantime, everything that they believe is designed. Everything they teach in our schools, everything they uh, uh, make into movies, the messages of the movies, the TV shows, uh, the newspaper stories that they pick and how they spin them have but one criterion for truth, beauty, honesty, etc., etc., and that's does it tear down what is good and elevate what is evil? Does it tear down what is right and elevate what is wrong? Does it tear down the behaviors that lead to success and elevate the ones that lead to failure until there's nothing left to believe in? So you guys might recognize this as the paradigm and the purpose of one of the most successful liberal motion pictures of all time, Fahrenheit 9-11. See, there's nobody, and I'm always told, don't say nobody, don't say always, don't say... There's nobody who believes Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11 was an honest attempt to accurately portray the real events of that horrific day in its aftermath. Everybody knows that, that Michael Moore is a leftist and that it was a propaganda film in which the facts were cherry-picked the evidence manipulated, the narrative near lunatic, all designed for one purpose. The question that we were debating at the time is should we go to war against the Iraqi government, against Saddam Hussein? So he used all of the tricks and manipulations and lies that he could to show that America isn't that good, America is not worth fighting for, to show that Saddam Hussein isn't that evil, not worth fighting against, for the purpose of undermining our efforts to go to war. Again, there's quite literally nothing in, in Hollywood, in the newspapers, in our schools that is not, does not have this as its sole criterion. 
For example, there is no journalistic standard, none, zero, zilch, by which the misdeeds of a handful of night guards at an obscure prison for terrorists, misdeeds in which nobody was killed, nobody was seriously hurt, there is no journalistic standard by which this is a front page story in the New York Times, much less for two days in a row, five days in a row. 10 days in a row, 20 days, 44 straight days, this non-story was a front-page story in the New York Times. Why? Because while it met no journalistic standard, it met the one and only modern liberal standard. It said, you think America's good? We found something that's going to make you not believe that any longer. You think that the Islamic fascists are bad? No, 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 no. This is why they do it. No wonder they fly airplanes into our buildings. And that's just one of so many other examples. News, Newsweek magazine, there was no journalistic standard by which they, they printed the story of uh, um, uh, Korans being flushed down the toilet. Not only was it a bogus story, never happened, it's an impossible story. It cannot happen. Think about it. Can you flush a book down a toilet? <laughs> right? Try it. Go home and try it. And if there are any liberals here, go to your neighbor's house and borrow a book. And see. And but the things, even a child, did, did you just get here, sir? Should I start over? <laughs> At any rate, even a five year old would know that you can't flush a book down the toilet the first day that he plays that, that, that puzzle at school. You can't fit a square peg into a round hole. So, why did Newsweek run with a story that was not only bogus, that, that failed to meet even the most uh, obvious logic? I mean, as I say, it's an it's, it's, it's old expression. You can't fit a square peg into a round hole because nothing matters to them. There is no standard because a standard would require them to say something is better than something else, which goes against this entire philosophy. It met the one and only criterion of truth to Newsweek, which was that it attacked America and justified the Islamic fascist terrorists. And you see this, the same thing is true in the art world. There is no artistic standard. There's no aesthetic criterion by which, forgive me, but a jar of urine with a cross in it is beautiful. There's no aesthetic criterion by which the curators of the museum said, yeah, take down the Monet and put up the urine. But it met the one and only standard of art that exists to the modern liberal. And just as in Hollywood, the movies last year, I, I don't want to speak to the movies that were nominated this year because I didn't see them all, but the movies from last year met no criterion of storytelling, met no criterion of cinematography. The five nominees for Best Picture all met one criterion. Broback Mountain said uh, heterosexual marriage isn't that important. Go be a homosexual if you choose. Uh, Munich said there is no difference between the terrorists and the people who stopped them from murdering again. And if you look at the other pictures as well, ultimately with Crash winning, Crash said America is this evil, horrible nation where every moment of every day is, is, is filled with bigotry and racism. I, I'm going to repeat it probably for a third time now because it's so important. It's so hard to really accept. But there truly is no standard, no criterion for truth, beauty, justice, or anything else amongst the modern liberal, the dominant force in today's Democratic Party. Not all Democrats. Okay, there are words for Democrats who have standards. It's called Republicans. And it's true. I mean, there, there are a good many of us who have come to become Republicans and then conservatives. And, and even not, there are some who are still Democrats. Tammy Bruce is a lesbian feminist, former president of now's largest chapter, who recognizes, well, you know what, at a minimum standard, let's stop the people who want to hack off our heads. That's a starting point. There are people who get it. The thing is this, clearly not everyone. Are you guys with me, by the way? Talk to me. I'm, I'm, I'm here. It's live. <laughs> it's, it's just so austere. It's the Heritage Foundation. <laughs> now, clearly not everybody who voted for John Kerry, not everyone, like I say my cousin, but I'll be honest with you, it's my sister, um, who, who will mindlessly accept, without question, without doubt, that of course we went into Iraq to steal their oil, because that's what America does. No need to even consider any other possibility. That's how sure she is that America is imperialist and we steal resources and whatnot. Not everyone who voted for John Kerry and who fits that description is aware of the elite's blueprint for utopia. That's what I call it. But what the elite have succeeded in doing, and by the way, I don't think they would support it if they were. I don't think my, my cousin would uh, trade off supporting evil, failure, and wrong for some promise of a future utopia. But what the elite have succeeded in doing through the institutions we've allowed them to control, and if we're going to save America, we must take back 
the schools, the universities, the media, the entertainment industry. What the elite have succeeded in doing is indoctrinating, starting with the very young and going all the way up through college and beyond, starting the first time they turn on Sesame Street and Buster Bunny, going up through the middle years when they're told, hey, little boy, if you have a queer eye, you're going to be a cool guy. But hey, little girl, it doesn't matter how cool you are. If you grow up to be a heterosexual married woman, you're going to be a desperate housewife. And going all the way up, and all the other shows that are on the air, I can't say all, but so many of the other shows that are on the air that show family and marriage and all the things that are traditional that we recognize as good, there's the war at home. There's a... a, a Terms of engagement, there's another, it's not terms, it's uh, rules of engagement, as if it's another battle. Um, they wouldn't allow, uh, make room for daddy in shows like those because they were, they were not realistic, so instead we now have the Bundys, where the mother and the father hate each other and looking to get as much as they can from each other, and just this whole mindset, and it continues on through Ward Churchill's ethnic studies class. And what happens is they're indoctrinated into what I call a cult of indiscriminateness. And the way the elite does this is by teaching our children, starting with the very young, that rational and moral thought is an act of bigotry. That no matter how sincerely you may seek to gather the facts, no matter how earnestly you may look at the evidence, no matter how disciplined you may try to be in, in, in your reasoning, your conclusion is going to be so tainted by your personal bigotries, by your upbringing, by your religion, by the color of your skin, by the nation of your great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather's birth, that no matter what your conclusion, it is useless. It is, it is nothing other than a reflection of your bigotries. And therefore, the only way to eliminate bigotry is to eliminate rational thought. You know, there's a brilliant book out there, and to those of you who know it will, know, uh, will recognize how ev heavily informed my opinion is by it. It's called The Closing of the American Mind by Professor Alan Bloom. And Professor Bloom was trying to figure out, I'm going to be blunt, he was a little less blunt. He was trying to figure out in the 80s why his students were suddenly so stupid. And what he came to was the, re the realization, the recognition, that they'd been raised to believe that indiscriminateness is a moral imperative because its opposite is the evil of having discriminated. Right? I paraphrase this in my own works. I say, in order to eliminate discrimination, the modern liberal has opted to become utterly indiscriminate. I'll give you an example. At the airports, in order to not discriminate, we have to intentionally make ourselves stupid. We have to intentionally pretend we don't know some of the things we do know. And we have to pretend that the next person who's likely to, to blow up an airplane is as much the 87-year-old Swedish great-great-grandmother as those uh, four 27-year-old imams newly arrived from Syria screaming Allah Akbar just before they board the plane. In order to eliminate discrimination, the modern liberal has opted to become utterly indiscriminate. The problem is, of course, that the ability to discriminate to thoughtfully choose the better of the available options, as in she's a discriminating shopper, is the essence of rational thought. So quite literally, we are dealing with the whole of Western Europe and today's Democratic Party dominated as it is by, by this philosophy that rejects rational thought as a hate crime. So what you're left with after 10, 12, 14, 20 years in the leftist indoctrination centers that our schools have become are citizens of voting age who on the one hand are utterly unwilling and incapable of critically judging the merits of the positions they hold and have held unquestioned since they're five years old, since they first entered the leftist indoctrination process. All right, this, this is important to me because that sounds impossible. I mean, are you saying that they have the mentality of five-year-olds? You know, that sounds like hyperbole, and I've tried to avoid hyperbole. It, it, it sounds perhaps, you know, as a gratuitous slander. There was a book that came out at just about the same time as Professor Bloom's, that in some ways even better describes and, and explains the mindset of the modern liberal. It was called All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And it reads like the Bible of modern liberalism and the playbook of Democratic Party policy. Yes, of course, you know, you'll notice in the title, he doesn't say, Robert Fulgham doesn't say, All I Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Of course, Bill Maher has learned a, a good number of things, including bigger words. But the concepts that he still holds dear, that he, he learned in kindergarten. So yeah, the set, sentence fragment, don't hit, which is one of the lessons that Fulgram refers to, has morphed into an entire sentence now that they're adults. It's war is not the answer. And of course they've learned things in between, but they didn't really need to know anything. 
Because even though they know about, uh, I'm going to say Ward Church, uh, Neville Chamberlain, even though they know about Neville Chamberlain, they know about what happens if you appease evil, they don't really need to know it, because knowing it or not knowing it would not have changed the position they have now and have held unquestioned since they're five. You know, when I was five years old, I used to go around the neighborhood trick-or-treating with my friends on Halloween, not, not every day. And... Um, <laughs> And we'd have in one hand a bag for candy, and the other hand a little box with a slit on top for nickels and dimes and pennies for UNICEF, for the United Nations. Right? Because at five years old, the United Nations is a terrific thing. Don't hit talk. Another lesson from Robert Fulgham is share everything. Well, yeah, we'll share power. We'll share our wealth. We'll pay for the United Nations. Let's talk things out. What a lovely, wonderful thing. Then you turn 10, 15, 20, and you learn some things that, about the United Nations that change your opinion. You learn about the corruption. You learn about the anti-Semitism. You learn about the, uh, they ran away from, from uh, the genocide in Rwanda. have done nothing about the, the Sudanese genocide. In fact, made the Sudanese members of the Human Rights Commission while they were committing this genocide. And you and I change our position because these are things we really need to know. Yet they will maintain their five-year-old's position, their belief that the United Nations is this great, wonderful thing, and completely ignore everything they've learned since and quite literally are locked into... There was a song that came out at about this time. Uh, it was called Goodbye Stranger by a group called Super Tramp. Because, you know, being a tramp is super. And um, in it, there's this guy and this girl hook up, they, and they shack up together for a couple of weeks, and apparently things are pretty wonderful until she says something like, Honey, we've run out of food. Why don't you go to the supermarket? And we could do this for another week or two. He says, I should go shopping? <laughs> you know, no, that's not my paradise. No, I'm leaving. And as he's walking out the door, he says to her, now, I believe that what you say is the undisputed truth. But I have to see things my own way just to keep me in my youth. And that is so much the mindset of the modern liberals. It's, it's not that they're not aware of all the things that we're aware of. It's that they need to reject them in order to remain in this five-year-old utopia that they've been told is, is the only hope for mankind. A mindless indiscriminateness. So what you're left with is not only adults, citizens of voting age who cannot judge their own positions but who are virulently antagonistic to any position other than their own. Why? Because when you've been brought up to believe that, that uh, indiscriminateness is a moral imperative any position other than their own must have employed discrimination. This is why Bush is Hitler. This is why Reagan is Hitler. This is why Giuliani is Hitler. How's Rudolf Giuliani like Hitler to a thinking person? Well, in one way. Hitler discriminated against the Jews. Rudolf Giuliani discriminated against the crack-addicted prostitutes in Times Square. Hitler discriminated against the Catholics. Giuliani discriminated against the, the uh, criminal overlords. Right? Hitler discriminated against the gypsies. Giuliani discriminated against the terrorists on 9-11 and beyond. See, any form of discrimination is discrimination. They know that theirs is the position arrived at through the moral imperative of indiscriminateness. Therefore, any position other than their own must have been arrived at through, through, through the, the employment of discrimination. So this makes you not just wrong on, on your issues and your stances. They don't even think about your issues and your stances. They don't have to. Even if they were willing to, even if they were able to, they don't need to. You know, would you sit and, and contemplate Hitler's social security policy? No, you would fight Hitler. So what you're left with is, after 10, 12, 14, 20 years in these indoctrination centers, and it's not a coincidence that the longer you stay in the indoctrination process, the more morally inverted you become. Until, to be head of the Ethnic Studies Department, you have to argue that the Islamic fascist terrorists are the good guys, and the victims of 9-11 were all little Eichmanns. So what you're left with is people who quite literally cannot differentiate between good and evil, right and wrong, better and worse. And, but here's a key. Indiscriminateness of thought does not lead to indiscriminateness of policy. Indiscriminateness of thought invariably leads the modern liberal, inevitably leads them to side with evil over good, wrong over right, and the behaviors that lead to failure over those that lead to success. Why? Because in a world where you are indiscriminate, where no behavior is to be deemed better or worse than any other, then your expectation is that all behavior should lead to equally good outcomes. When in the real world, different behaviors lead to different outcomes. You and I know why. Because we think. Uh, we know why teenage promiscuity and communities that promote promiscuity tend to fail at a greater rate than communities that promote teenage uh, abstinence. Because teenage promiscuity and teenage abstinence are not the same behaviors. Teenage abstinence is a better behavior. 
I forget the moral component for a moment. Let's just talk practicalities. If your boy's out messing around, he's not home reading a book. If your daughter's down at the abortion mill again, she's not at the library studying for the SATs. If your son's in a hospital bed somewhere dying of AIDS, he's not putting together his five-year plan. So you and I recognize why those communities that promote teenage abstinence do better than those that promote teenage promiscuity in their music, in their, in their, in their movies, even in the schools. But to the modern liberal who cannot make that judgment, must not make that judgment, that would be discriminating. They have no explanation. So therefore, the only explanation for success has to be that somehow success has cheated. Success, simply by its existence, is proof positive to the modern liberal of some kind of chicanery and likely bigotry. Failure, simply by its existence, no other evidence needed, just the fact that it has failed is enough proof to them that, that failure has been victimized. So the mindless foot soldier, which is what I call the, the non-elite, will support the elite's blueprint for utopia, will side with evil over good, wrong over right, and the behaviors that lead to failure over those that lead to success, and have a sense of justice. This is why I said at the beginning, they're not evil. My, 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 my cousin is not evil. But it's just a mindless acceptance that in a world where she's indiscriminate, where her answer to any political question is, so what? Without any true uh, Socratic desire to have that so what lead to, yeah, let's talk about the real consequences. So what just being an indiscriminate rejection of any possibility about the future? It's, it's, it's meaningless to them. And it's why John Lennon said utopia was all the people living for today. And by the way, it is not a coincidence that those who live for today now have so much debt. What is debt? It's the failure to repay a promise from yesterday. And vote themselves nothing but more and more entitlements, which is what? Stuff for me, I'll worry about who pays for it later. The same is true of good and evil. Since nothing can be deemed good, nothing can be deemed evil, that which society does recognize as good must be the beneficiary of some sort of prejudice. That which society recognizes as evil must be the victim of that prejudice. So again, the mindless foot soldier will invariably side with whatever policy, mindlessly accept whatever policy seems to tear down, seeks to tear, excuse me, tear down what is good, America, Israel, Walmart, elevate what is evil, until everything meets in the middle and there's nothing left to fight about. Folks, let's take, let's take an issue in the news and let's think like a modern liberal. And you will see how once you subscribe, once you've been indoctrinated into this mindset, there is no other choice. Remember I said it was inevitable. Once you belong to this cult of indiscriminateness, there is no other conclusion you can come to than that good is evil and that evil is the victim of good. We all know it's standard practice, in fact, it's official policy at the leftist media outlets to never call Islamic Jihad, uh, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, uh, Hamas, Al-Aqsa's Mars Brigade, or any of the other Islamic fascist terror groups around the world, terrorists. And you know why, you've heard it a million times. Uh, in fact, it's even in one of the official memos from, uh, I, I forget the news organization, might have, probably the Times, to, to the reporters ordering them not to use the appropriate word. And that reason is, hey, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Who are we to employ critical, rational judgment? But if one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, see, you and I can tell the difference. We, at least as a very minimum standard, can't we at least agree that in order to be called a freedom fighter, you have to be fighting for freedom? Yeah. Right? We know what Osama bin Laden is fighting for. He's told us. It's not freedom. It's an oppressive theocracy in which women are covered from head to toe. And unless we all change to, to, to his religion, we are considered the offspring of pigs and monkeys. You know, you'd think at least we'd have PETA on our side. I figured it was time for a joke. <laughs> Just in case some of you have been fooled going, he's not that funny. <laughs> we expected something very different. But quite, quite literally... Being indiscriminate leaves people like Cindy Sheehan and Michael Moore, they will call Osama bin Laden a freedom fighter. Because quite literally, being indiscriminate leaves them the, un, unable to tell the difference between freedom and having your head hacked off. That is quite literally how, how sick this mentality is. All right, so if there is no objective difference between the terrorist and the freedom fighter, then why is it that you and I in, in our schools teach that George Washington is a hero? 
and Yasser Arafat and Saddam Hussein are villains. See, you and I know why, because we think George Washington risked his personal fortune to personally lead his troops into battle. Battles fought nobly against other uniformed warriors for the purpose of creating the freest nation in the history of the world. Pretty noble, pretty heroic stuff. Yasser Arafat, on the other hand, stole his people's money, sent 14-year-olds out to fight his battle. Battles fought against kids and women and civilians and pizza parlors and, and at Passover ceremonies and whatnot, all for the purpose of maintaining his corrupt dictatorship. Pretty villainous stuff. But to the folks at the New York Times who have established as official policy that there is no objective difference between the terrorist and the freedom fighter, why do we teach our children that George Washington is a hero? The only possible explanation is because he's a white Christian of European descent. If there is no difference between the behaviors of the terrorists, then why do we teach that Yasser Arafat and Saddam Hussein are villains? There can be no other reason than the darker-skinned Muslims of Middle Eastern birth. So when push comes to shove, and after 18 United Nations resolutions, and 10 years of having our airplanes shot at in direct violation of our very clear agreements, after Saddam Hussein had invaded Iran and invaded Kuwait, bombed Saudi Arabia and bombed Israel, committed atrocities against the Kurds in the north and committing genocide against the Marsh Arabs in the south, we finally and reluctantly go to war to liberate those poor people. You and I know why. Because we think. Because we make critical, rational, moral judgments. But to the modern liberal, to the mindless, to those who cannot discriminate between these behaviors, the only possible explanation for us going to war is some nefarious cause because we're evil and Saddam Hussein therefore is a victim. And they will rush there, as we've seen, and act as human shields to protect his rape rooms and his torture chambers because they won't judge rape rooms and torture chambers. That requires judgment. And if you listened to the chants of, of, of the mindless minions as they marched down the street in their anti-America rallies, which the forged document users and the leftist press euphemistically called anti-war rallies, you could hear their chant, one, two, three, four, we don't want your racist war. What, what race exactly comprises Iraq. What, what are they talking about? They don't know. There's not a clue. It's not a factual statement. It's not an accurate statement. Wait a second. Didn't we just recently go to war to protect Muslims in Kuwait? Didn't we bomb the Christians of Europe to, to protect the Muslims of Europe? I mean, what is this based on? It's based on the reality that once you subscribe to indiscriminateness, anything other than indiscriminateness is the evil of having discriminated. Alright, well, I, I'm open for questions if Do, do we have any questions? I'll, I'll, I'm going to be leading it. Sure. Yes. We have a microphone approaching. Uh, I did note you repeatedly use the term uh, modern liberal. When you go back in time, how do you view other uh, definitions of liberal, you know, religiously when uh, liberals were called bleeding hearts relating to uh, Jesus Christ and... Uh, in classical intellectual thought, uh, I know a lot of libertarians today like to call themselves liberal in the classical sense. Uh, you know, how do you view modern liberalism with uh, past liberalism? Okay, I, and, and just to be clear, normally I would refer to the difference between lowercase l and uppercase l because simply because I refer to these people as modern liberals, I do that because it did come out of the liberal what we thought was the liberal tradition, but went uh, a, a new direction. So I needed a way to both uh, distinguish them as having a history, but that what they are now is very different than what they were. In fact, modern liberalism, uppercase L, is about as illiberal a philosophy that, that we'd had in America. And though it's not quite yet gotten as violent as some others have, it's, it, I fear that it's on its way. You know, the one thing as, as you go back through time, there was always a sense that we were trying to work towards something. There was a belief that there was something better than what came before. This modern liberalism is nihilism in a lot of ways. And, and while they will constantly argue, question authority, question your government, don't trust, uh, don't trust your neighbors, don't trust Walmart, everybody's out to get you, they don't really replace it with anything. And so there is no... Uh, there, there is no thing to aim for that then you can make a judgment as to whether that's a truly good thing to do. I, I think more than anything, missing from modern liberalism 
is, is anything other than its destructive nature. It, it tears down the authority of people in the schools, you know, the authorities of the old textbooks and whatnot, the, the, the heroism of the people that we would look up to and teach our children to look up to, but replaces it with, with, with nothing. Is that fair? Well, uh, do you have any more? No, that's it. On the past, <laughs> Liberals of the past, you oh, you know what? In, in a lot of ways, John Kennedy, uh, Martin Luther King, just to go back to what, what would be my distant past, you're talking about the 70s being their distant past, the 60s would be my distant past. There, there was always a liberal tradition in, in America, starting with the founding fathers and, and prior, that was accepting of, look, it's very, very, very rare that the majority would cede so many rights and, and recognize the rights came to everybody and that they didn't come from the powers here but came from a, a greater power than ourselves. I mean, the powers that the minorities have in America and have always had in America, and I include myself as a Jew amongst the minorities, uh, is, is unprecedented in human history, and that was true liberalism. The, the fact that it wasn't uh, forced upon people, that free speech... And these things that we're losing now, like free speech in our schools and whatnot, is the opposite of what the liberalism was, whether there was a D next to John Kennedy's name or, or not. You know, some of the same values that were liberal back in the 60s uh, are, are conservative now. I'll give as an example, you know, a colorblind society. That remains a liberal concept. Unfortunately, it's not from the modern liberal uppercase L point of view. Hi. Owen Graham, intern here at Foreign Policy at Heritage. Hey, Owen. How are you? Thank you very much for this talk. I was happily surprised and so glad that you what mentioned... What did you expect, like a rubber chicken? And no, 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 no. No, I was... I, I loved everything, but right when you got to Alan Bloom's book, I couldn't believe it because I think this is one of the most pivotal books, The Closing of the American Mind. Yeah. The other book that brought so many people into conservatism was, of course, The Road to Serfdom. Mm -hmm. um, but this book is also mentioned by... Bork and a whole bunch of other people, uh, yeah. a lot of very famous conservatives. Yeah. But I think this is the main, what you're touching on, your expansion on Bloom's book and everything I needed. Yeah, to I, I put Bloom in this place, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think you, uh, you've come to the nexus of what, of what we as conservatives confront because it really is a revolution. As Bloom puts it, um, it's changing everything from a right society to the privileging of differences and the lack of being capable of making decisions based on principles. Right. The only principle is that you can't discriminate. Right. You can't discriminate against anything. And, and so and, it really is the again, failure of thought. Right, and, and again, if I may, it's in, indiscriminateness of thought doesn't just lead to sometimes being right. It actually is a philosophy that has uh, an inevitable conclusion, which is, you know, Bloom talks about seeking the good. And, and that's what we try to do. It doesn't mean we're always right. doesn't mean we always get there. doesn't mean we don't stumble along the way. But without a recognition of good, then how do you progress towards good? Which, which, which puts the lie to the concept that modern liberalism is, is progressive in any fashion. If they have nothing to progress towards, if there is no good then they, they are forcing every single generation to not only reinvent the wheel, but to fight every battle we've ever fought to get to this great nation, this great time that, we are, that we're in. Well, I, I thank you, and I hope you're counseling some of, our, our, the, con, some of the conservative candidates uh, to bring this up, uh, because I think it's, it has permeated everything. It is. It is quite literally everything. That's why I didn't hesitate at the beginning to say, you know, my people tell me, don't say always. Don't. It, it is quite literally everything. It is the only standard in Hollywood. It's the only standard for journalism. It's the only standard for art. It's the only standard for justice. Everything quite literally is defined. You know, one of the, one of the big canards of, of modern liberalism is this notion of diversity, as if diversity is a virtue. Diversity is not a virtue. Diversity is meaningless. Diversity just means different without the critical and moral judgment to say, yes, it's different and good, you are not only not supporting good, but quite literally in a good society, you are invariably supporting evil, failed, and wrong. Because our melting pot melted out some of the failed behavior, some of the worse, lesser behavior, some of the, uh, most of, I mean, that's how we became such a terrific nation, was taking the best and, and burning aside, or leaving aside the rest. Well, that, makes it rare, that makes the bad behaviors rare in our society, so to be diverse, you have to promote that which is rare. Common sense 
and conventional wisdom are both rejected for no other reason that they're common and conventional. So quite literally, you find again the modern liberal championing always that which is the worst. Thank you. I'd like to play the devil's advocate. Okay. Just for the sake of platonic dialogue or whatever it's called. Alan Nichols, Washington Diplomat Magazine. If, if Hillary Clinton were here, sitting here, listening to you, mm -hmm. trying to be open to you, assuming she's capable of it, she would say, I, you see, you have a perspective, but I also am working toward the good. Mm -hmm. You say liberals don't work toward the good. But Hillary would say, I want universal health care because I believe that it is best for the American citizens. Mm -hmm. Oh no, ab absolutely there's no doubt and I, and I really did try to stress at the beginning that I don't consider them necessarily evil I absolutely believe th that uh, my, my sister and others believe that they are working towards the good the problem is that once you've eliminated critical rational judgment once you, you've eliminated uh, the ability to tell the difference between what works and what doesn't work once you're coming from a mindset of a five year old look, when I was five years old Four. I don't want to be called a lying liar by Al Franken. I was four, not five. Um, the New York World's Fair closed up in, in, in my neighborhood down the street from me. And I insisted that my father buy the monorail that went around the park because I, I wanted to uh, put it up alongside the Long Island Expressway and ease congestion and, and, and end pollution because, you know, I was a, a, a liberal kid. And uh, he explained to me in grown-up fashion that you couldn't afford it. You know, we, we couldn't afford it. And technically getting the rights of way and the bureaucracy and the... And when you have a conversation with a, with a modern liberal about health care, there's no doubt that their goal is as good as mine was, curing uh, air pollution or curing uh, uh, everybody's health problems. But if you don't have the grown-up sense to be able to discuss how, what, what's the reality, what's the truth, uh, you, you can't have a conversation where they make the world a better place. It's all fantasy at that point. You know, and again, you're dealing with a five-year-old, so of course she wants to make the world a better place. Uh, very, very few of us don't. It's, it's a matter of having given, up having given up the ability to discriminate. A, they can't bring it about because it's a childish conversation. And B, when you have to make the decisions about who gets certain things, for example, instead of health care, let's talk welfare, or health care, let's talk illegal aliens. Certain decisions have to be made about who qualifies for it. Um, and when you're just going to indiscriminately give all these benefits, then, then you're actually going to be assisting that which is most failed because they're the ones who are going to be most in need. To make sense, I, I wasn't thrilled with my answer. Global, global warming and Al Gore, if you have... Well, I absolutely, I'm convinced that global warming is not a position that they've arrived at through an honest and sincere look at the scientific data and the recognition that these models... Look, we don't even trust models of weather three days down the road on, on the nightly news but we're going to trust this one for 50 years down the road and whatnot. I don't think it's an honest attempt to understand global warming. I think it's a, 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 a plot. What a bad choice of words. I'm going to have a Hillary Clinton thing now. But uh, because in one fell swoop, you can turn America from the greatest nation in the history of the world. Our productivity feeds the world, provides the medicines, of, and turn America into the most evil nation in the history of the world. Look how much we're, we're destroying the world. It's, more of an, it's accepted more because it's an attack on America as evil polluters than it is because it's scientifically supported. Yes, sir. Since you're, since you're here from Hollywood, let's talk about future. There are conservatives in Hollywood. They mm -hmm. just don't want to put their heads out of the hole in the ground. Where do you see us getting ever to the tipping point, or where can we get along the road of retaking well, let, let, me, let me tie these two questions together very quickly. One, one of the things that, that conservatives recognize is that the answer to problems is, is progress. And fortunately, progress has seen us, uh, technological progress has seen the conservatives find alternative methods. You know, back in the studio day when you needed to work at the studio and there was no place else to go, but now you have a Mel Gibson who can find unique ways of distributing and promoting, and there's the Liberty Film Festival that my friends run and whatnot. There's, there's, I'm able to promote my shows via the internet and through all kinds of technologies that, that would have made it impossible just five or seven or ten years ago. So as uh, more and more channels come on cable, you're going to have more and more opportunities for unique voices. 
And because we are so incredibly right, they find us. <laughs> okay, one more question? We have one last question. Okay, right here. Hey, um, can you talk about the term progressivism, how that sort of replaced liberalism in a lot of ways as yeah. a new way the left talks about themselves and what it means to be a progressive towards what you say is no vision? Sure. You know, recasting yourself by name is something that, first of all, we know in Hollywood have known. I mean, it's, you know, Rock Hudson. I don't think he was born Rock Hudson and whatnot. Um, what I find interesting is how often what the liberal claims about himself is exactly the opposite of what the truth is. And how they'll, you know, the Chris, and they're, like, Chris Matthews has a show, Hardball, as if the title is going to tell us what the show really is when it's really quite the opposite. Um, they've come to recognize that people recognize liberalism in its modern form as the policies that have failed our schools, the policies that have failed us as a nation, the policies that have done so little to, to help the black community get out of uh, the, the rut that it's been in for the last 40 years in some ways, uh, and that it is a pejorative. And it's funny because the liberal very much recognized themselves. I was, remember watching Hannity and Combs, and Sean Hannity said of Nancy Pelosi that she's a San Francisco liberal, and immediately Combs yelled at him that he was trying to demonize her. Well, how do you demonize somebody by stating the facts? Maybe there's a problem here. So suddenly they decide, okay, people have caught on to us about liberalism. Now let's call ourselves progressive. We won't be progressive in the slightest. It's just a name. It's an advertising slogan. All right. Well, let's, th let's give us a big thank you. Thank you. Well, that was a rousing beginning to our series on changing culture and bringing people, unique people, who've been involved in this cultural battle from outside the Washington, D.C. area. So let me just say before we uh, close today, thank you again for coming. Our next uh, program in this uh, uh, series is going to be on March the 13th. Is that the correct date? March the 13th at uh, 7 o'clock. We're going to have a one-woman show presented by an actress who lived and worked in Hollywood who's come to Washington, D.C. So we invite you all to come to that. We're going to have a reception at 6.30, and then the show will be at 7 o'clock in the evening here uh, at the Heritage Foundation. Wait, wait, wait. She got a reception and I didn't. <laughs> we'll take you to lunch. All right, thank you all very much. Have a great day.